A long time ago, Princeton University did an experiment on their seminary students to prove that when we are rushed, we struggle to make good decisions. Things like patience and kindness and presence suffer when we are in a hurry. And so basically, they had a group of students who wrote a paper, and then they, they came in to turn in the paper, and they told those students, you have to go share this paper with a, a group of people. You have to go and present your paper, and you need to do that, um, and it's in a different building on campus. So they're all sitting in the one building. They're like, you have to go across campus, across the road to another building and they split the students into three groups. The first group, they told them, you are late. They are waiting for you right now. Go fast, right? So that was the high hurry group. The second group, they said, uh, it's, they are ready for you now, so please go right over. So you're not late, but go right now. And that was the medium hurry group. And the last group was told, uh, it's going to be a few minutes before they're ready for you, but you should head over now. They're going to be ready very soon. So that's the low hurry group. Now here was the trick. Each of these students, as they moved from one building to the next building, they would encounter someone in their path who needed help. I think the university recruited some of the theater students to have people on the path between the two buildings who are in clear need. The person would appear destitute, slouched, uh, trouble walking, and it was very clear that they needed assistance. They would ask for assistance. Now, you probably know where this is going, yes? 10% of students in the high percent uh, the high hurry group stopped to help. 90% blew right past the person in need. Then 45% of the medium hurry group helped. And the low hurry group had the highest percent with 64% stopping to help the victim. <laughs> Today, we are continuing our series in a, uh, that's called I, The Lies I Tell Myself. And what we're going to see is that there are a lot of lies that we believe. And those lies form us. They shape us into who we are. They keep us from becoming the person that God has made us to be. And here's the thing. A lie that you believe will affect you just the same as if it was true. But praise Jesus, he has given us his word because what we're going to see is that the word of God rips apart the lies of the world. His truth breaks open the cage that we have built for ourselves. And those lies do not have control over you. Last week we saw, we, we talked about lack and about how our culture has taught us that we are not enough. And so we turned to Psalm 23, and we saw that Jesus is everything we need. It pushed back on that scarcity mindset. But today we're going to talk about hurry. The lie that we tell ourselves is, I can't slow down. And I said this this last week. There are moments in life where the grind is such a grind and the rat race is a hamster wheel that we cannot get off, we cannot slow down, and we just have to keep going. And what we saw with the psychological study from Princeton and what we see in each and every one of our lives every single day is that love is incompatible with hurry. Love is incompatible with hurry. So let's dive in. If you want to grab your Bible or look it up on your phone, we're going to get started in Psalm chapter 23. Now, one of the beautiful things about this series that we're doing is that it only needs one verse. If we pay attention and we look closely, God only needs one verse to bust you out of the prison of lies that we live in. So last week, we looked at Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Or the King James, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Right? And it's kind of like a, a memory verse. Do you remember those from when you were a kid? If you have no idea what I'm talking about, some traditions uh, with Sunday school and like the kids programs, they would do memory verses and they'd be like, this is your memory verse for the week. And then maybe there'd be like candy or a treat or something. I'm seeing some nodding heads. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Well, this is kind of like a memory verse for adults. I don't have candy. I'm so sorry. But the memory verse this week is Psalm 23. And Psalm 23 says, sorry, Psalm 23 verse 2. It says, he lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. Now, Okay, I, I need to admit something to you all. This is the New Living Translation. It's a modern translation, the one I'm preaching from. And I, I really enjoy it. I like it because it's very clear and it's easy to understand. And I'm always looking for ways to make God's word easy to understand. 
But can I confess something to you guys? On this, when it comes to Psalm 23, and only Psalm 23, I kind of like the King James Version better. And I know, I know, I'm, I'm supposed to be like the young pastor with the hair and the tattoos, and you know, the King James Version, that's not trendy. But it's just, I, I like the New King James Version just a little bit better. It's the one I memorized as a kid. And it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. And I know, I know we don't use the word restoreth in the modern world ever, but it's, darn it, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's poetic, and I love it. And so I'm going to use it for a second. Can we put verse 2 on the screen, please? Um, I want to walk through this. Now, there's two big things. It says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Now, I wanna, there's two things I want to show you. Number one, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Now, to really understand this, we have to dive into the world that it was written in. We have this framework of shepherds and sheep. Jesus is the shepherd, we are the sheep. And that's really easy. But to really understand what it means, I went this past week, I had to go learn a bunch of stuff about sheep and shepherding and how that works. And so I found some cool stuff and I want to show it to you. Did you know you can't train sheep to lie down? You can't get, like, they don't sit on command, right? Like, you can do it with dogs. You can even do it with toddlers, right? It's like, just sit down and get you a treat. They'll sit for you if you do it. But sheep won't. Sheep will not sit down on command. They will only lie down when they feel safe. When a sheep will only lie down if they have plenty to eat, plenty to drink, and they're not threatened by predators or insects. Actually, that sounds a lot like me. You have to set things up just right for a sheep to be able to relax. The shepherd has to pay attention to the environment in order to create a space for sheep to relax. And we're going to come back to that, but isn't that just like most human beings, right? Have you ever had trouble falling asleep at night? No, you don't have to raise your hand, but I, this is something I struggle. Maybe you're stressed about that thing at work, or there's a lot going on, and you lay down, and you're supposed to be sleeping, but your mind starts racing. Has this ever happened for you? happens to me every now and then. Normally, I have no problem falling asleep. I'm so good at sleeping. I'm like a professional sleeper. Like, I'm just, I'm a good sleeper. But every now and then, I'll have something going on in life. I'll be going through a season, and I'm stressing, and I just, I can't. And you ever do that thing where you're laying in bed, and you're looking at the clock, and you're watching it, and you're like, brain, go to sleep. And you're telling your brain, go to sleep right now, and you do the math that horrible math where you're sitting there and you're like, right now, seven hours of sleep. Six and a half. Five and a half. It's not enough, but I can make it if I go right now. And when you focus on it, you, you can't force your brain to relax. If you've ever done those studies where it's like, here's how you sleep train yourself and how you get out of your brain and how you can fall asleep, almost all of those exercises are ways that you take your mind off of your mind. Because if you focus on it, you can't force yourself to relax. Here's another thing I learned. The good shepherd makes me lie down in green pastures. Apparently, green pastures are super sparse in the ancient Near East. And I never really thought about that before, but it makes sense, right? There's lots of deserts in there, and it only rains for three months of the year, De December, January, and February. So when it rains, there's pockets of green grass. But for nine months, the grass is brown. And it's sparse and brittle. It's almost like hay or straw. And that's what the sheep normally eat. And so on average, a shepherd will move their sheep five square miles in a day just to keep their sheep from overgrazing the brown, dry land. So it's, eating is constant movement. That's what it means for a shepherd. When I was in seminary, I actually got to go to Israel. And it was amazing. It was a really cool trip. And one of those days, we were headed up to a historical site. And over the hill comes this whole herd of sheep and they just like walked in between us we were going up this path and it's like there's sheep everywhere and we didn't really know what was going on it was like what is happening right now there's sheep and then we saw a couple of guys come up over the hill and they were clearly the shepherds they were taking tending to the sheep no they were not wearing the stereotypical guard with the little crooked stick they were just dressed like the rest of us but um, they were still tending the sheep and they were moving them they had a dog and they were like moving them from patch to patch and so that's what eating, uh, having the sheep at eat meant back then. And so when the Bible says he makes me lie down 
in green pastures. That would have been really strange to the shepherds who were hearing it. They were like, wait, what are you talking about? You want me to hold still? You want me to stop moving? You want, what do you, you want me to rest? Now, here's what I want you to pull from all of this. The world is not going to encourage you to rest. You have to carve out the time. Everything around us is going to tell us that you cannot slow down. And there is this pressure in our culture to, to, to fill every waking moment with productivity, with product, with more. But the good shepherd makes us lie down. Following Jesus means we have to find a rhythm of rest. Actually, let's jump back into Genesis chapter 1 real quick. Now, you've probably heard of Genesis chapter 1, right? Even non-Christians. I mean, it's pretty famous, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? We've heard this. And it's a beautiful picture of the creator speaking and creating and shaping the entire universe. And they put it into a framework of a week, Yes? Day one, he creates day, the light and the dark. Day two, water. Day three, land. Day four, plants. Day five, the stars and the moon and the, the fish and the birds. And then day six, anim- all the other animals and humans. Now, here's why I bring this up. Six days to create everything that is. And then in chapter one, verse 31, it says, Then God looked over all that he had made, and he saw that it was very good. An evening passed and morning came, marking the sixth day. And so the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. And on the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from his work. And God blessed the seventh day. He declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. So God rested on the seventh day. Why? Why did God rest on the seventh day? When I was a kid, it was always kind of presented to me as like, well, he's probably tired from all that creating, right? Like, we fabricates the whole universe. He probably needed a nap, right? And you teach it to the kids, and they're like, God needed a little nap. And maybe that's a cute way to explain it to kiddos, especially if you're trying to get them to go down for a nap. It's like, God took a nap. You need to take a nap, But if you think about it, it doesn't really make any sense. Think about this. Think about this. What is the verb they use for God creating? Like, what does God do in order to make stuff? Speaks, right? He talks. He speaks. Think about this. For God, the creation of the universe is as easy as speaking. And as a professional talking person, let me tell you, talking doesn't make us tired, right? You can ask my wife. I can talk all day. I'm so good at talking. I can talk. No problem. Doesn't make me tired. God does not rest because he is tired. God rested at the beginning of creation because he knew you would need rest this week. Let me say it again. God rested at the beginning of creation because he knew you would need rest this week. He set up a rhythm for how humans can thrive. And he did that not because he needed rest, but because you need rest. Psalm tells us, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. That's a command to rest. Now, hold on a second. I kind of feel like the sham wow guy. I'm like, but wait, there's more. Well, can we put Psalm 23, verse 2 back on the screen again? It says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Now, here's another thing I learned this past week when I was studying the sheep. Sheep, I learned three things. Number one, they're really dumb. Sheep are so dumb. It's amazing. Number two, they don't lie down unless they want to. <laughs> and number three, sheep are super skittish. They spook so easily. Sheep are actually, they're so skittish that they are afraid to drink from moving water. If the water is fast moving like a river or a stream, they actually won't drink from it because the swift waters freak them out. So what shepherds would do is in certain places along the riverbank, they would carve out a little cove, like a little nook for the water to fill in, and then they would have a pool, a small natural pool along the stream. That The sheep will line right up for that. They will drink from still waters, but they won't drink from the river. Now, here's why this matters. Our society keeps getting faster and faster and faster. Hurry sickness pervades our lives. We are afraid of slowing down. 
We are afraid of falling behind, of being left out, being forgotten. And underneath that panic, underneath that hurry is the lie, I can't slow down. But what God's word is telling us today is you have to slow down. In order to flourish, in order to thrive, in order to survive as a human being, you need to drink from still waters. And this isn't just in Genesis. The Bible is constantly reminding us to rest. The word Sabbath is used 154 times in the Bible. The word rest is used 508 times in the Bible. Rest. And if you don't know, Sabbath is the Jewish word for day seven. Right? It's the Jewish word for the, the day in which they would rest. It comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, which literally means to stop. To stop. And actually, it's, what's cool about it is it can also be translated as to delight. So it's to stop and delight. And there's this idea, that's what Sabbath is. We need to rest by stopping and delighting in God. You know what it reminds me of? Is my children brushing their teeth. Don't worry, I'll connect the dots. I'll explain. <laughs> One of the places where hurry invades my life and makes me worse at loving is with my children. I, <laughs> I have seen, do you remember how I said at the beginning that love is incompatible with hurry? That is the truth. Love is incompatible with hurry. I have seen it over and over with my children. I, have you ever noticed this? Children never hurry when you need them to hurry. Yes? The parents in the room, maybe you know what I'm talking about. You get out of the car and it's raining and you're in a dangerous parking lot and it's like, come on, bud, we gotta get in the store quick. And he's like, but look, there's a rock over here. And he just like, but dad, you, I got to acknowledge the bird. Tell me that you see the bird before I move my feet. And it's like, but just get into, the, right? They never hurry when they want to hurry. Now, okay, <laughs> they're the worst at hurrying. Now, I don't want you to raise your hands, but parents, I want to ask you a question. How many of you acted maybe in an unchristlike manner getting your children ready for church this morning? <laughs> We do. It's so hard. But you know what? For me, it's bedtime. Bedtime is where I, I am so impatient at bedtime. I have five children, four of whom are boys who are able to brush their own teeth. They are able to, but they don't, <laughs> right? And so I'll get them all set up and I'll lay, lay out all the toothbrushes and I'm like, all right, yeah, we can do this. But they take a hundred years to brush their teeth every night. It's, we do this every day multiple times a day. It's like, come on, brush your teeth. And I'll lay it all out. And I'm like, okay, here, boys, you brush your teeth. I'll be right back. I'm going to go check on your sister. I'll come back 10 minutes later. They've done nothing. One of them has climbed up onto the counter and is dancing and making faces in the mirror. The little one, the, the other one, he's like, he hasn't even put the toothbrush in his mouth because he's too busy trying to tell me a story. And then the little one's gotten into the toilet paper again. And he's unspooling it and feeding it into the toilet and flushing it, just like, how much can I get in there? And I'm just about to lose my mind. And then my wife comes in, <laughs> and she can hear me struggling, right? Some of it is self-reflection, but most of it is my, my wife helping me to see what I'm doing wrong. Because um, I feel like bedtime should take 10 minutes. And it's taking like 45 minutes, right? And this is getting ridiculous. And she can hear me struggling and getting upset. So she comes in, and she's like, you okay? okay, you seem a little upset. Do you need me to tap in? <laughs> like, are you, are you going to be okay? And I have this moment where I'm like, I try to explain it to her why I'm so upset. I'm like, well, the, 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 and the, the four-year-old is acting like a four-year-old. And then I have this moment of, oh, yeah, they're not doing anything wrong. They're, they're toddlers. I'm the one forcing this hurry schedule on their life. And so I uh, have been working on this, and that was my moment when I realized that hurry is incompatible with love. And I was letting hurry dictate and control how much I was loving my children. And so and I'm still a work in progress, and Jesus is still working on my heart. But man, I try to enjoy every minute of teeth brushing, right? It's a lot more chaotic, and it still takes forever. But now we have teeth brushing parties in the Manshrek household. That's how we do it. I get them all out, and I'm like, I'm going to put some music on. Let's dance. We're just going to sing and brush, and we're going to do this. The word Shabbat can be translated as to stop or to delight. And that is a method for you to push back against the hurry in your life. 
For me, it's to stop and delight in my children while they're still children. And pushing back the hurry, it helps me to love better. Now, let me drive it home with one last point. This has been proven in study after study. There is no correlation between hurry and productivity. Once you work a certain number of hours in a week, productivity plummets. Do you know what that number is? They've shown this over and over again in different studies, 55 hours a week. And what's ironic is that's about a six-day work week. When one study literally found there is zero difference in productivity between workers who log 70 hours and workers who logged 55. God's truth is written into the rhythm of our lives. God is speaking to us, even in just our natural body's rhythm of rest. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. The good shepherd is calling you to rest. The good news that I have for you today, and it's just jumping off the page, is that God gives us a rhythm of rest. We see it back in Genesis. We see it in our psalm. We see it all over the Bible. God gives us a rhythm of rest. And if you can live into that rhythm, then you will be able to flourish and thrive as a person in this world. That's how we were made to be. In the creation story at the beginning of the book, it's like God is teaching a little child how to do something. Right? Like God, and there's the kid and all of humanity, and he's like, okay, I'm going to go first. I'm going to do this, and then I want you to do it. God is basically saying, okay, watch what daddy does, and then he rests. That's what God does in Genesis chapter 1. He rests. And I want to say, and I want to say there's two levels of this. Number one, we need to rest once a week. Take a day off to set aside time and focus on God. But we also need it on a daily level. We need rest every day, every single day. We got to carve out some time to be still, to drink from the still waters and spend some time with God. And actually, there is one more level to this. In the stillness, that is where you meet God. Slowing down, it's not just about rest. It's about finding ourselves in front of God. Because when we slow down, when we stop, you itch. Do you know what I'm talking about? When you stop and you sit still, you just, ah, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, how many, how long can you stand in line before you got to bust out your phone, right? You're at the post office, you're in the grocery store, you see there's three people in front of you. What do you do? And out comes the phone. Yeah? I can't sit still. I can't be still in the moment. As a culture, our ability to be still without distraction is shrinking. We have the greatest and most effective distractions in the most convenient method riding around in our pockets every single day. But it is in the stillness where we meet God. Let me say it again. It is in the stillness when we meet God. Sky Jatani once said, boredom is a fruit of the spirit. I think what he probably meant was peace and patience. But if you put those together, that's what happens. We rest beside the still waters. And when we rest, that's when the lie comes out. When you start to hold still, that's when the lie shows up. It's like, I can't slow down. You're going to get the itch. It's like, I need to be doing something. And if I can't do something, then I need to distract myself. Even in the modern world, even when we are resting, we are watching TV, right? We are distracting ourselves. For the younger generation, one TV screen's not enough. I need to be watching TV while scrolling on my phone. I need at least two layers of distraction because we are running away from stillness. We are running away from quiet because it makes us uncomfortable, because it makes us vulnerable. But that is the space where you find God. When you turn everything off, that is where you will find God. When you learn to reach for God in the stillness, you don't need to reach for the other stuff quite as much. Boredom can actually be a great thing. Boredom is a good, it's a gift for us to learn how to reach for God because it puts you in a place where you can reach for Jesus. So I have two challenges for you today, two ways that I want you to take this good news and put it into your life. Number one, carve out time for God. The world's not going to give you time. They're not going to hand it to you. You've got to carve it out. You have to take it from them. Um, carve out time, which probably means take stuff off of your schedule and don't fill it back up again, <laughs> right? Say, okay, I'm going to carve out this time and don't put anything back in that time. I, um, 
That's my problem, personally. I carve out time for God all the time, but then I immediately fill it back up with other stuff, right? It's like, all right, today's my day off. Today, I'm going to Sabbath. I'm going to focus on God. I'm going to just rest. And then 10 seconds later, I'm like, but what else could I get done, right? Like, oh, I'm not going to work. But then I look at my home list. All right, what's my, do, what's my to-do list? What can I get done in my Sabbath? As some of you know, I do a lot of stuff on social media. I make little videos. I post lots of things. And, and I like doing that. I want there to be Christian presence in content creation. But I also know social media apps are not good for us. They're not healthy devices. So for the last few years, what I have done is I kind of had to deal with myself. If I'm going to make a ton of content and post it on all these social medias and be really involved, Involved, then every Lent, I got to take that stuff off my phone, right? I don't delete my accounts, but I, I take all the apps, all the social media apps off of my phone. And I'm going to carve out time, and I'm, I'm going to give my morning to God. I'm not going to scroll on my phone. And so I delete those apps. Every Lent, I delete the apps off my phone. Do you know what happens? I still pull out my phone. It's amazing. It's like muscle memory. It's like there's nothing on this phone anymore. I took all the apps off, but I still opened it up. And I'm like, oh, that's right. There's nothing on there. What's Google up to, you know? Is there anything good on Wikipedia? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm starved for it. How can I distract myself? Like, I'm, like, clicking through, trying to find something to fill that space with. And maybe for you, it's not your phone. Maybe it's the news program. Have you ever just had TV on all day? Like you're not even watching it. It's just there. I have to have it on. Or, or maybe it's the, the latest thing that you're streaming. Or maybe it's the earbuds and the podcasts you listen to. We can't be still. We have to layer distractions into our life. Um, we fill the stillness in a thousand different ways. But there's only one of those ways that's going to give you rest. So that's my challenge for you this week. I want you to carve out time for God and don't fill it up with something else. And maybe that for you, that means 10 minutes, right? Every morning, give yourself 10 minutes. Or maybe that means more. I hope it does mean more. Say no to things. Take something off your schedule. Find stillness in your day. That's my first challenge. The second challenge, it comes right out of that. Carve out the time. That's first. Then second, I want you to wait. Wait for God in the stillness. And this is something we need to practice. It's, we're not good at it. I said earlier that peace and patience are fruits of the Spirit. But here's the thing about fruit. Fruit is grown. You're not going to wake up tomorrow and be suddenly good at sitting still, at finding peace in the stillness. We have to carve out time. We have to wait. And when we do that, when you carve out time, hurry is going to come knocking and boredom is going to come knocking, and productivity is going to come knocking. And what I want you to do this week, I want you to ignore them all. Make them wait outside. <laughs> Don't reduce your Sabbath to an hour service on a Sunday morning that you can check off your list when you get home. Sabbath means you stop and you delight. So that's what I want you to do this week. I want you to stop. Find ways to stop and delight. Carve out time and wait for God in the stillness. It's awkward. It's difficult. But when you get good at it, it changes your life. It gives you a peace inside that can, it's unrivaled. Love is incompatible with hurry. Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, he gives us super clear guidance on this. He makes us lie down. He leads us to still waters. So let me leave you with this. There's a line from an old Mark Wahlberg movie, Shooter, where he says, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And I love that line because it applies to so much of our life. When you hurry, when you rush, you're more likely to make mistakes. And when you make those mistakes, the, the, you have to do it all over again. But if you slow down, you can do things smoothly. And when things go smoothly, they go faster. And so when I say take things off your schedule, I'm not telling you to do less in life. I'm saying if you slow down and you find rest, you find the rhythm that God has created for us, you will be capable and more able to flourish as a person. And I hope it was obvious in this message, I, I need to hear these words. Right? I'm up here preaching to you, but I'm also sitting right there. <laughs> This is a for me sermon also. Last week we had those cards that were right here. This is one of the cards I picked up because I struggled with slowing down just on a personal level. And actually, I want to mention those cards are out there in the lobby. I hope you'll look them over. Find the one that means something to you. There's a lie on one side and the truth on the other. Find your truth that will push back the lies you tell yourself. 
I need this message too. The lie that I tell myself every day is I cannot slow down. But God's truth is pushing back, nudging us in a healthier direction. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Let's pray.